Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Secretary General, dear Jens, even though these days give us no reason to celebrate, I would like to use this opportunity to congratulate you on your birthday yesterday. Uh, we are nevertheless meeting in a time of war, death and destruction in this Europe of ours, and every day we are witnessing ever more horrific crimes committed in Putin's war against the people of Ukraine. In Mariupol, we see in a particularly heinous way the means employed in this war. What kind of military target is a clinic for pregnant women and newborns? What kind of military target is a theater outside which families seeking shelter had written in giant letters the word children? What kind of commander issues the command to bomb that very same place? For weeks now we've been given ever new justifications for this war, ever new threats, ever new pretexts. However, this behavior goes to show that this war of aggression is targeted at the desire for freedom of the people in Ukraine. And thus, this is also a war waged against our values our European freedom. And we, the Alliance, have to take this threat seriously, and we have to adapt our security provisions accordingly. This is why we, the German government, decided yesterday to make available an additional 100 billion euro to strengthen the ability of our alliance to defend itself. This is why we intend to strengthen the eastern flank of the alliance militarily, also by sending troops of the Federal Armed Forces. And this is why, on the road towards the NATO summit this summer, we will continue to intensify discuss together what impact the fact will have that Russia has bid farewell to the European Peaceful Order for the strategic concept of NATO. Dear Jens, this time of war, however, is also a time of unity and cohesion. In the European Union, in NATO and in the G7, we resolutely stand against this war. In the, Secret in the General Assembly of the United Nations, we resolutely stand against this war. However, given this unity and cohesion, we have to fairly distribute burdens. Apart from standing at the side of the people affected especially hard by this war, we also have to assist those countries that are affected by the impact in the immediate vicinity. The Republic of Moldova has about 2.5 million inhabitants, but it is enormously vulnerable in economic terms. Nevertheless, it has shown a tremendous level of solidarity with its neighbors. When I visited the Republic of Moldova last week, I pressured them and promised our assistance. As a first step, we will take in 2,500 refugees from Moldova to Germany, and I'm pleased to see that other partners have followed suit in making similar promises and pledges. However, we are all quite clear about the fact that this cannot be but a beginning, in view of the fact the, how many million people have already fled the country and how many will continue to flee Ukraine. What we need now is a common airlift of solidarity to Europe and across the Atlantic. What we have to do is to pick up these people from the external borders of Europe and bring them to safety. At the beginning of this horrible war, many people traveled here using their own cars. Many people came here have, who had relatives and friends in the European Union. Many people came here who were able to take a few things of their belongings with them. However, as the war has become ever more brutal, ever more horrific, we increasingly have an influx of people who were unable to take anything with them, people who are wounded, who are hurt. Often we get children without any elderly or adult accompanying them. We cannot leave them to their own devices, saying they will spread across Europe somehow. When I, as I said, visited the Republic of Moldova, I met an 80-year-old woman, and I did 
didn't dare ask, but then at the end of the day, I asked her where she wanted to travel, but I was sure she couldn't give me an answer to this. And she said, well, basically, I only want to go to heaven. I have nothing left. I lost all my relatives. I've every I lost everything I had. This woman, like so many other people, is not in a position to find a place for herself. So it is our shared, our common task as the governments of the European Union uh, to work together with our partners to help these people. We had a G7 uh, VTC of foreign ministers today, and we once again agreed that we wanted to make sure that as the distribution of the refugees is concerned, we would want to cooperate very closely, not only within the European Union, but also within the G7 countries. And I know that all allies in NATO will um, also do their bit, apart from doing their bit, to ensure our ability to defend and protect ourselves, and will continue to cooperate in the next weeks and months. In the group of the G7 foreign ministers, we today agreed that we want to set up a support group for Moldova. It's designed to be a flexible international support platform, the purpose of which is to assist Moldova in overcoming the present crisis, but also beyond. The first step will be to organize a conference to support Moldova, a conference that brings together all the relevant actors and will be dedicated to strengthening the resilience of this country in the face of the crisis. I am convinced that in this very dark moment of history, we will have to keep the light of humanity afloat. This is what we dedicate ourselves to. We will put all our effort into this. That's, I would like to thank you, Jens. I would like to thank the Secretary General for coming here today. Minister Baerbock, dear Anna Lena, thank you so much for your warm welcome and for your kind words. It's uh, Great to be back in Berlin and to meet uh, with you and also many thanks for your strong personal commitment uh, to our transatlantic alliance. Uh, Germans uh, uh, leadership and Germans, uh, Germany's leading role in our alliance is of key importance uh, for uh, uh, all of us at this uh, turning point of uh, uh, European uh, security. President Putin's war uh, in Ukraine is killing innocent civilians and causing massive destruction every day, forcing millions to flee their country and undermining the international rules-based order we all believe in. NATO's response has been swift and decisive. We continue to provide uh, strong support to the courageous um, Ukrainian people and armed forces, and Germany is playing a key role with military supplies financial and humanitarian aid, and also by hosting uh, more and more uh, refugees. Allies have imposed uh, unprecedented costs uh, on Russia, and our sanctions are hurting Putin's ability to wage war. Germany's um, efforts here are critical too, including through uh, the European Union and the G7. We have also rapidly reinforced NATO's deterrence and defense. Germany has stepped up, including with more troops in Lithuania and jets in Romania. We also work together to manage the risk of further escalation, because we have a responsibility to ensure that this conflict does not escalate beyond Ukraine. That would be even more devastating and more dangerous. We are facing a new reality, so we must also reset our deterrence and defence for the longer term. And we have already started addressing this uh, in NATO. Reinforcing our defences will require increased defence investments. Germany is leading by example, including with major increases to the budget, and your decision to invest in fifth generation aircraft. I really welcome Germany's tireless efforts to find a diplomatic solution to the crisis in Ukraine, including your government's direct contacts with the Kremlin. At next week's NATO summit, we will address the consequences of Russia's invasion. Our strong support to Ukraine 
and further steps to strengthen NATO's deterrence and defense. North America and Europe stand united uh, in uh, NATO, determined to protect our people and our values. So once again, Delana Lena, it's great to be here, and I look forward to our meeting, and I also look forward, very much forward to continue to work with you, uh, because your leadership and your strong message on the need for standing together, facing this new reality, is something that is important for the whole alliance. So thank you so much. Two or three questions. Deutsche Welle. A question to both of you. Madam Minister, you spoke about strengthening the eastern flank. What does that mean in concrete terms? How many troops are to go where? Does this also include new equipment? Mr. Secretary General, what are the dimensions of strengthening the alliance that you're talking about? And a second question, um, if I may, you also listen to what Zelensky said today. He said Germany was not doing enough for Ukraine. What is your view with regard to the speed in which Germany is trying to rearm itself? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. NATO's ministers of defense tasked the military bodies of NATO yesterday to draft proposals for a more long-term adaptation of NATO's uh, defense capabilities. Part and parcel of that will undoubtedly be enhancing the troops that are being positioned and deployed. NATO has already increased our deterrence and defence, especially in the eastern part of the lines. Uh, we now have hundreds of thousands of troops on heightened alert across the lines. Uh, we have uh, 100,000 US uh, forces troops in Europe. Uh, that has increased by several thousands just over the last uh, weeks. And then we have 40,000 troops under direct NATO command. Uh, especially in the Eastern part of the Alliance, uh, and uh, the German uh, leadership of the BAT group uh, in Lithuania, and the doubling of the number of German forces there is uh, just one example of this increased presence uh, on land, in the air, and at sea. This is our immediate response, uh, sending a clear message to Moscow that uh, an attack on uh, one ally will trigger a response from the whole Alliance, one for all, all for one. But then we have also started the process in NATO uh, to assess the more longer-term consequences for our deterrence and defence. And we have asked our military commanders to provide advice. We will receive that advice uh, within uh, some weeks. And then based on uh, those uh, advices from uh, our military commanders, uh, we will take the political decisions on how to further strengthen uh, for the more longer-term uh, our uh, deterrence and defence. The deterrence and defence is not about provoking a conflict, but it is about preventing a conflict. It, it's about preserving peace. And NATO's core task is to preserve peace, prevent conflict. Uh, we have done so for more than 70 years, uh, and we need to continue to do that in a new uh, security uh, reality. On um, Ukraine, I will just say that I fully understand the frustration and the desperation that President Zelensky and the Ukrainian people feel, because they are in an extremely uh, difficult uh, uh, situation where they see civilian casualties, um, uh, uh, destruction every day, uh, including uh, attacks on uh, hospitals, schools, uh, civilian infrastructure. Uh, and that's also the reason why NATO allies have stepped up um, uh, their support, uh, also delivering advanced uh, weapon systems, uh, air and missile defense, anti-tank weapons, uh, fuel ammunition, which is uh, critical for the resistance that the Ukrainian forces are able uh, to mobilize against uh, the invading uh, uh, Russian uh, forces. Uh, and at the Defence Ministerial meeting yesterday, allies uh, uh, stated and committed to continue to provide critical support to Ukraine. Um, let me also add that we have also actually supported Ukraine um, significantly since 2014, uh, since Russia illegally annexed Crimea. Since then, NATO allies uh, and NATO have uh, supported Ukraine in many different ways. Allies have trained tens of thousands of Ukrainian troops, which are now on the front line fighting the invading forces. We have equipped them over many years with uh, 
uh, missile defense with air defense with, uh, uh, with many types of equipment. So the Ukrainian army uh, defense forces is much bigger, much stronger, much better equipped, much better trained, much better commanded now than in 2014. It's first and foremost the, 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 the bravery, the, the, the courage of the Ukrainian uh, armed forces uh, which has enabled them to resist the invading uh, Russian forces. But of course the support we have been giving them for many years has proven to be extremely important and therefore we'll continue to provide support to Ukraine. Die nächste Frage kommt von Jörg Blank von der DPA. Jörg Blank, DPA. A question addressed to both of you. We've heard speculations about the possibility of cancelling the NATO-Russia founding act. Is that conceivable to you in face of Russia's actions in Ukraine? And a question addressed to the minister. The Eastern European heads of government drove to Kiev in an act of solidarity. Could you think or consider a similar act of solidarity? As concerns your first question, let me say we, the Allies, have spoken out uh, and explained and expressed our commitment to the NATO-Russia Founding Act, and we continue to stand by that. It is Russia that, in a very brutal way, has called into question the NATO-Russian Founding Act, has violated it, and thus violated peace in Europe. For me, it is crystal clear that, with an eye to these violations of the Founding Act, we cannot just overlook these violations. It is an absolute breach of international law. It is also a breach of the NATO-Russia Founding Act, was Wafa has done, and the Founding Act has provided the guarantee for security in Europe. I think we have found a clear answer to these breaches. The sanctions that we have passed, especially the forced package of sanctions that has just been passed, and we've clearly condemned the breach and violation of international law and the violation of the NATO-Russia Founding Act. And as the Secretary General quite clearly said, at this point in time, we have to make sure we are protected. This includes the eastern flank. We have to enhance our protection there, as I underlined myself a minute ago. Also, with an eye to the eastern flank, we have to ensure that further troops are deployed there. But, and this has to be said clearly here and now, this happens explicitly on the basis of the NATO-Russia Founding Act, because it has made clear time and again that the self-commitments contained therein take place in a security environment. The minute the security environment was violated by Russia, it has created the basis for us increasing and enhancing our strength or being forced to increase and enhance our uh, defense at the eastern flank. And it was a one-sided breach and violation of the Founding Act. I've, I would like to remind you of the fact that, as Minister Barbok said, Russia has walked away. Russia has violated the uh, NATO-Russia Founding Act, uh, not only once, but actually every day since they illegally annexed uh, Crimea in 2014. Uh, because in the NATO-Russia Founding Act, it's clearly stated that uh, we should respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of every European nation within its international recognized borders. So there is no doubt that Russia, by annexing Crimea, they violated the NATO-Russia Founding Act. Then they continue, uh, continue to violate the Founding Act by destabilizing Eastern Ukraine, Donbas, by supporting the separatists. And now they have launched a full-fledged invasion of Ukraine, killing uh, uh, thousands of people, bombing cities, and waging a full-fledged war on Ukraine. This is a blatant violation of the core principles of the NATO-Russia Founding Act. So Russia has walked away. We will uh, do what is necessary to protect and defend all allies. Uh, and we do so to ensure that uh, there is no room for miscalculation or misunderstanding in Moscow about our ability uh, to stand by our commitments and we do so to prevent escalation. 
prevent that uh, the war in Ukraine, which is uh, dangerous, devastating and deadly, becomes even more devastating and deadly and dangerous uh, by becoming a full-fledged war between NATO and Russia. And to uh, prevent any miscalculation in Moscow about our ability to and commitment to defend all allies, we have increased the presence in the eastern part of the uh, alliance. Vielen Dank. Thank you.